everybody. I'm Eugene Driscoll. Welcome to Naval Gazing the Valley Indies podcast. I'm joined by my frequent co-host, reporter Ethan Fry. Hello. So the bluefish, the Bridgeport bluefish, that is, are going the way of the dinosaur. And we're going to talk about, we're going to wildly speculate. We're going to do everything that, that, that you're not supposed to do in journalism. We're just going to throw out wild ideas during this podcast mm. uh, about the Bridgeport bluefish, uh, whether or not, I don't know, maybe that could be a fit for uh, the towns of Derby and Ansonia, the cities. Uh, we broadcast in Ansonia. I live in Derby. and uh, But we're going to go, it's going to be more than that. It's just not going to be Ethan and I uh, uh, talking uh, on our hypothesis. We have a special, two special guests. First of all, we have joining us Hugh Bailey, the Connecticut Post, or actually Hearst Media, yes. Connecticut's business editor. Correct. I'm so happy I got that right. And it was Hugh's story that I had posted on the Valley Indy Facebook page yesterday. Yesterday being whatever day that was. Monday, uh, August, what? 14th. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, That sort of made me think like, hey, bring him to the Valley. Uh, your article probably says otherwise. I had, a, I, of course, it's the internet. I didn't read the article right, before I posted. That's right. right. Why but would that's, you? Yeah. That's the nature of the beast. I read the headline and, right. and right. like a line or two in the little description there. That's really all you need. Yeah. So I, I posted it thinking the valley. We will rally around this. Sure. You know, because I'm looking for some positive vibes. You know, on our Facebook page, sure. we're trying to engage readers and do all that stuff. And people basically were like, "You're a j- shut up." Don't know. Right. Don't do it. It was just a kind of a flood of negative comments. So, right. uh, but anyway, I'm sticking to my guns. This okay. is the theory. I'm, my theory is that it could work here. Okay. So that's Hugh Bailey. And then also joining us for a return appearance to the Valley Indie podcast is Sheila O'Malley. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about the bluefish. And I thought, and Sheila, for anyone keeping track at home, is the Director of Economic Development for the City of Ansonia and the City's Grant Writer. So, in addition to talking about the bluefish for a couple of minutes, I thought we could also sort of do a quick rundown of all the economic development activity that's happening in Ansonia. Because there's a lot. There's a lot of ebb and flow, a lot of things going on, and we've never actually sat down with you, I, I think, and just had like a overall conversation about what's going on and, and, and what you hope to get here and what you hope to get there and that sort of thing. Right. We do. We do. We have a lot going on in uh, Ansonia, and it's exciting because, you know, there's a lot of activity, particularly in the downtown area, um, and one whole block is going to see uh, redevelopment like it's never been before in the city, and that's very exciting. Um, we have a new police station, which will come online at 65 Main Street, um, and occupy a two buildings which are 85,000 square feet in total. So that's a that's an enormous uh, spot. The former Farrell Manufacturing co- headquarters was located there. We're going to put uh, our police department, which is in desperate need of a new uh, station, and they'll be downtown, which will provide some safety med- you know safety and comfort for the for the. Um, restaurants and retail we have downtown and it'll also increase foot traffic and then right next door adjacent to that uh, is 501 east main street and the developers are eager to get started on um, transforming that into a residential building which will consist of approximately 100 units to 120 units um, of residential And then right next to that are our two city-owned properties, which are about to be transferred over to Jerry Nasserino and Charlie Smith, which will bring another 90 units of residential and retail and restaurants on the first floor. So it's exciting, and it's going to take up an entire block, which will really, in a small city, has a tremendous impact, a block. And then just to add to that, uh, you're here to announce that the Bluefish are actually going to open up at the former Ansonia Copper and Brass. Well, I'm glad you said that because we do have the perfect spot for them. Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> see? There you go. We'll take them. It all fits. This, the city, um, the Ansonia Copper and Brass site 
a coupled with a few of the feral properties and what's known as the SHW. And we're talking about for anyone listening at home, or like you to go down on the southern end of Main Street and then make a left onto North Main Street, sort of that yep. entire corner, a large area. Yeah, it's North Main, Maple, uh, State Street, that intersection, and going north towards Seymour. Um, so total, that's about 65 acres. Which you know, which in the valley is to have that amount of contiguous space is a real benefit. Um, we've got a long way to go. We've got um, we're, we are in the beginning stages of putting together a request for some funding for a master development plan, um, which will take a look at that whole area, including our um, our redevelopment in the with the residential units and the police station. We're looking at the parking on East Main Street to try to accommodate all of this new redevelopment activity. So we're going to put together a master development plan, which may include a, a road um, that will be a more direct route to Route 8 and make that oh, site wow. more attractive. I know the Whoa. key The key is, and that includes the bluefish, the hmm. key is to make that site attractive. And what, you know, what can we do on our end to help put that site um, back into productive reuse? So, okay, so and we'll revisit uh, some of what's happening in Ansonia uh, in a couple of minutes because I also wanted to ask you about uh, businesses that are that are either moving or and confirm some rumors that we're hearing since sure. we got you live on a microphone. Not yeah. that we're live, actually, but but I want let, to let's talk to Hugh about uh, the bluefish uh, in general. I mean, okay. I might, has, has anybody here been to a bluefish game? Oh, yeah. Sure. RA training at Fairfield University, oh. 2000, you know. 2002 ish maybe yeah I've, I've, so 50 I, I, I got of the like a bunch of foul balls and stuff yeah so were you nice surprised time. to hear that they were closing up shop uh yeah yeah i mean i didn't think i didn't like I, I don't follow the team closely or that whole uh you know development or anything but i had been there because i know when i was at fairfield our uh, basketball and this is ethan team, talking not hugh i started off yeah, talking yeah. just i'm not our a broadcaster bas- the fairfield basketball team started playing games there uh, at the arena at Harbor Yard, which is next to the ballpark, and I was the sports editor of the student newspaper at the time, so we got in there and like took a tour of all the nice shiny arena and stuff. But I mean that that I I, I thought that would be more of like a an economic um, generator, or yeah, and I and, and then like frankly, there there the Fairfield fans weren't filling that stadium because the team wasn't very good when I went there. I don't know how much it's changed since, if at all. Just be, beyond the bluefish, it seemed like you know they were hosting uh, other events too, and it was a nice little you know uh, minor league ballpark, as far as I could I could always tell. So, and actually, we're out of time, Hugh. So, oh, thanks well, a lot for well, nice, yeah. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, like, yeah. Wait, let's let's go, establish. Yeah, ask your question, but I, I have a question for Hugh as well. Maybe maybe it'll dovetail with, with what you're going to ask him. But go ahead. So the article you published, yes. when was that? When did that come out? I'm looking Sunday. for it. It came out Sunday. Yes. Okay. Uh, and the headline, and I'll put this all when we put this on Val- when we put this on valleyindy.org. I'll have all the links. But the headline is titled "20 Years Later: Bridgeport Measures the Bluefish Effect." Right. So uh, go through the article. I mean, uh, sure. And was it? I mean, you you cover uh, Bridgeport, uh, and the Post does, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, were you guys surprised, or, right. or did you did you know this was coming? Um, this was not a big surprise. Um, the story of the bluefish, and it's sort of spelled out in the article, um, is that they were a huge sensation in 1998, and for a couple years after that, and they really drew fans, and they packed the house, and they led the league in attendance, and they really brought people into Bridgeport who never thought they would ever go into Bridgeport, uh, and it really, you know. Joe Gannum at the announcement for the amphitheater the other day said it, it bridged the urban suburban divide. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. And, and it really was sort of a, a, a catalyzing event in a lot of people's minds for Bridgeport development. It didn't last. And what happened is for a variety of reasons, um, a lot of different things you could point to that attendance started to slip and then it never really came back. And for the last probably decade or so, they've been near the bottom of the Atlantic League attendance. Um, the original owners sold. They were losing money. Uh, the team was bought by the, the guy who owns the league, Frank Bolton, um, in Long Island. Um, and there had been rumors for the last couple of years that that they were not long for this world. There was, um, you know, they, they had been extended a couple times on their lease at, at the ballpark. 
Um, two years ago, um, when the yard goats came to Hartford, well, I mean, they, they first came this year, but they started last year. They were all on the road. New Britain lost their team, and there was a rumor that, that New Britain was looking for an Atlantic League team, and people thought, well, that's probably going to be the Bluefish. And so that didn't happen, but there had just been a lot of talk about the Bluefish and whether they were long for this world, and, and most people thought that they were not. So when this happened, it really wasn't a big shock. And the article basically, uh, like I said, I didn't read it before I posted. Of course. And I thought, uh, you know, p- people in the Valley would immediately say, yeah, bring them here. Right. Our readers actually read the article. Okay, good. And then put in the comments, hey, dummy, basically. If you read the article, it says that the economic impact from something like a, a baseball stadium right. is minimal. Right, and, and I, I wish we had turned off the phone. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's just that's it's a phone in the background. That's ambiance. Yeah. That's right. It's very busy. Room. It's, it's a work. It does busy. make it sound busy yeah. here. Yeah. It's, and now I'm just paranoid though. I probably did something wrong. Like I posted probably a wrong a guy link. I emailed asking for him to email me information. He's probably calling oh, me with the information. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyway, that. yeah, that, that's that's one of the things that that I focused on is this issue of stadiums and their impact on development. And there's always this idea that. Well, if you build a stadium, it'll bring people into town and it'll boost development. People go to the restaurants, you'll get foot traffic. And the, the academic studies that have been done on this topic basically show that that's just not the case writ large. It's not really the case on a, on a general basis. Um, most of these studies focus on major league stadiums, on, you know, uh, $800 million football stadium in Dallas, something like that. You know, if you build a new stadium for the Jets, is it going to, you know, boost new york city you know tourism and heavily whatever. heavily populated areas right. too. huge no. hugely populated areas and and the answer is that they don't i mean these these teams use you know this sort of ransom almost they say well if you don't build us this monstrosity of a stadium we're going to leave you know the yankees aren't going to leave new york you know but they they use these things um sort of hold the cities hostage and the city say okay we'll we'll shell out the 500 million dollars because we don't want to lose the team we don't want to look bad we don't want to have this shabby old stadium whatever it is um, and teams get their way. So the, most of the research focuses on that, the, the big-time stuff. There's less um, studies on smaller-time stadiums, you know, double-A, triple-A, Which is independent amazing, league. considering how many we have in Connecticut. There are so many that, more. That, that no right, yeah. right. Um, but the ones that have been done show that, y- that there can be an impact. They, they, they can, you know, raise median income to some degree. Um, really, you're talking higher-level teams, double-A teams, things like that, independent league, smaller Lower level stuff really doesn't have any kind of impact. That has that has and, been found in studies. And like I, as as you mentioned the yard goats, and I, I like it, the, what you're saying sort of rings true because like I, I maybe it's like I follow a lot of people from Hartford on like social media and stuff, just like people from the current and stuff, right. uh, just because I know them from working in that area. Of years Ooh la ago. la, mm. yeah. <laughs> Um, but like, and it, like, it seems like every night, like one of them is like catching the yard goats game, you know, right. cause it's like, it's uh, the, you know, the novelty hasn't worn off yet, but right. like in five years, will they be, you know, I, I, you know, I doubt that, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah. That, that, that was, I mean, you, you could have, if you, if there had been social media in Bridgeport in 1998, everybody would have been saying, Hey, you've been to the bluefish game. It's just, it's the, the thing to do. So it's interesting from reading your article to look back at how mayor Ganim, you know, was sort of uh, hanging his hat. Uh, the, the thought being that, yeah, this this will change everything. Right. Uh, and yeah, I don't. And, and the whole thing of whether it's not going to raise uh, people's income. I mean, right. obviously, you know, if you're if you're selling beer in a, in a municipal or in a stadium, in a baseball stadium, you know, that's th- these jobs aren't million dollar jobs. Right. Right. But OK, now let's let's bring it around to uh, to the valley, though. Sure. Right. We're talking. uh well, first, I'll just say I don't think that the, the, the bluefish can be characterized as a failure. If you look at the fact they were around for 20 years mm-hmm. and the fact that they transformed basically a bombed out ghost town, right, in a former industrial, maybe I, I, I'm just making that assumption. We're but talking about nothing, Bridgeport or the South End or you mean exactly like, where just the property. OK, the, yeah, the yeah. property was the, the was, property was was bad. Yeah. And explain it in your professional editor terms. I mean, it was, it was a brownfield. It was an abandoned factory. It had been empty for 10 years. It, you know, it looked bad. You know, there's, everybody knows what these places look like. Where we have them in, in Sonia and Derby. Right, right. And then they transformed it into, into a stadium for 10 years. And now we're seeing, you can kind of look at it, I think, as the next step in the evolution of this former contaminated site is that it's going to be a, uh, an amphitheater, a theater of some kind right. for, 
for performances. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody would say it was it was a failure. Um, th- there's there's a lot of a lot of nuance to it. Um, you know, Bridgeport. I started working in Bridgeport in 2003, so that was five years after the Bluefish started. And you know, I tell the story a lot to people about when they ask about Bridgeport. Is it better? When I first pulled in for my first interview with the Connecticut Post in 2003, I parked in front of this building that had broken windows and just boarded up, and everything was just, you know. It, disaster. And I honestly asked myself before I walked in, I said, do I really want to work in a place like this? And now in 2017, you know, that building has offices on the ground floor and it has apartments up above. And most buildings in downtown Bridgeport are in some phase of that kind of development. They have some sort of develop, some sort of store, if it's, you know, a restaurant, whatever, on the ground floor and apartments up above. So the city has improved dramatically in the downtown area. The question of whether the bluefish were any sort of catalyzing factor in that, I really don't know that you can say that they were. I, th- I think that you can definitely say that it was a psychological impact for people to come into Bridgeport, people who never thought they would come into Bridgeport, people from Fairfield, Westport, whatever. In terms of whether the city's downtown development would have happened without them, probably it would have. So, you know, wh- what price do you put on a psychological impact? That's, that's a good question. So Ansonia and Derby, my theory is that we're sort of a mini Bridgeport in a lot of ways. We, we face a lot of the same uh, uh, challenges uh, as, as Bridgeport does on a smaller scale. Uh, and maybe we'll just throw this out with you guys being really the experts and me and Ethan just being the guys uh, running the podcast. Couldn't something like, and, and Bolton, the owner, is, he doesn't, he's not leaving willingly. He's basically saying they're showing me the door. Right. Uh, I'd rather stay. Right. Could something like that have an impact in a place like Ansonia? Maybe not, we're not going to pin, uh, you know, the streets aren't going to be paved in gold because the uh, Ansonia recruited a baseball team, but could that be a viable use, Sheila? And do you think it's something the city would, are we just speculating on a hypothesis or, or, or could you make a call and say, hey, Mr. Bolton, have you heard of Mayor Cassetti? No, I mean, <laughs> I think first Rock of the all, Valley, Rock the Valley this weekend. You know, you know he's heard of mention. Mayor Cassetti, come on. First of all, okay. thanks, Ethan. Okay. First of all, Eugene, I think you were unfairly criticized. Let me just put that put that out there. Um, you know, I think I think as a mayor, as Mayor Cassetti will say, and the administration says, we you have to be open to all kinds of suggestions, and you have to be creative about economic development. There are trends, and certainly the trend at the time they came in was, you know, that that. Um, people wanted to go and see this baseball team play and I think it worked for a little while but trends come and they and they go you know malls were in they're out um so So depressing yeah I mean Ansonia is a big sports town so you know that's that's key here we're we're big sports fans football more than baseball but you know as Mayor Cassetti wants to to point out we've got a we we need a championship baseball team we're going to work on that so um i i i don't know i mean i wouldn't reject the the idea uh at face value Just i right, think when you, when you face a huge it's sorry, my fault not, for setting up the microphones not, like this. Uh, but when you turn away i can't you're gonna miss it. the gems that are coming exactly out of mouth, we, right people okay. gotta hear this all right so i you know we <laughs> especially for saying nice things about me sheila people <laughs> okay, need to Eugene. hear this we certainly um we certainly would be open to that and and i i certainly you know wouldn't uh i, I wouldn't um I would contact Bolton and see You'd if he was interested. You'd return those calls. I you certainly wouldn't. would. Yep. Absolutely. Not like Ethan calling you. Absolutely. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's I'm just having, not true. I'm having fun. But uh, let's read some of the comments uh, that, that our readers... And just if Go I, ahead. If Go I ahead. could ask you, was the city of Bridgeport like involved in terms of either subsidizing or yes. tax incentivizing that? Yes. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was public-private partnership. Okay. Okay. Um, there was quite a bit of public money that went into it, and then there was a lot of state money that went into the arena which came mm-hmm. after. Um, and, and that's really the issue is whether, you know, when the public money goes into these things, does the public get a return? Good investment and, you know, not. that's, that's yeah. a real open question. Um, Although I, the question's been answered, though, if they, they were around for 20 years and now you've got an old factory that's becoming, I mean, you know, right, but, Bon but Jovi's going to be playing there in a couple the, of years. But the, the, issue, the issue is opportunity like it or not. cost. I mean, it's like... Say it again, I stepped The up. issue is opportunity cost. It's like you, you spend the money right. on a stadium, could you have spent it on something else? Could you have put in a pedestrian plaza or something that would have been this... You know, amazing waterfront experience, or you know, something different. Would it have been as effective or more effective had you done something different? Just Some, because you did a stadium doesn't mean it's the only thing that could have. Yeah, but sometimes those types on. of um, 
those types of developments draw more public assistance because sure. they think that the cost benefit analysis, you know, that the cost is going to, that the benefit's going to outweigh the cost sure. in the long run. So that that's a whole other interesting thing to note. So as a grant writer and economic development director, when you're trying to uh, get public funding or state money to help get some of these projects off the ground, you have to pay attention to what they're funding. There's trends going on. So if, uh, you know, if Ansonia, everybody in Ansonia decided we want to open up a children's museum on Main Street, that might not be something you could do because the state might not say, okay, we're going to give you money for that. You have to prove there's a need, I guess. Yeah, that's true. And in the Valley and, and in Bridgeport, certainly there's that it's not a difficult thing to prove there's need, you know. And so for years, the, the city hasn't received very much money. So now, you know, uh, I'm looking at every opportunity where we want to we want to see what we can do to boost economic development here. And so you, ha- you do have to, though, weigh those opportunities. For instance, if you're if you're fixing sidewalks on Prindle Avenue, if you want to put sidewalks in on Prindle Avenue, is the city going to do that anyway? And if so, you know, better get 80% of it paid than having the city pay for 100%. Then, then it makes sense. That's a good, that's a good example of um, cost-benefit analysis. So. Okay. So here we are. The, uh, when I, I posted Hugh's article uh, yesterday at 10.45 a.m., uh, the first comment was from a y- Ryan Wyatt. He said, uh, put them back where the Ravens played. That New was uh, Yale Field, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you can see I'm from New York. I don't know any of this background. <laughs> and then we had uh, Tracy. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to even try to say your last name, Tracy. I apologize. I'll just call you Yerk. Tracy Yerk says she quotes Hughes' article. She's. I just. I love the. She read the article. Okay. Across numerous studies in recent decades, researchers have agreed that sports teams are a poor investment for a local economy. <laughs> uh, and then I got on there. I, you know, keep them out of Derby. She said. The mayor doesn't need any more excuses to raise our taxes. I just want to <laughs> wow. say, okay. in Derby, it's actually the tax board, not the mayor directly who, uh, who raises your taxes. Uh, uh, then I had said, uh, yeah, I said what I said. Uh, then Tony Mamone, I believe that's an Ansonia resident, said, the bluefish drew minimum crowds. Let them go. Hmm. Dare to dream. I'm just, it's just a dream. Chris <laughs> Papson, would you suggest building a stadium for them in Ansonia or Derby, and who would pay for it? And I said, you know, uh, we've got the uh, Copper and Brass and Farrells right here. Could be, could be a possible location. You got the uh, Derby Redevelopment Zone, although they, they have a plan that doesn't include a stadium. One of their options was to do some type of playing field. But I think that's a possible uh, uh, location. You know, you can, you can even call it Twin ri- Rivers, you know, just nickname it that. I'm sure, sure. it's being used already, but... Yeah. Two Rivers yeah. Stadium, yeah. Two Rivers like, Stadium, uh, right? Is that... to the old Pirates, uh, sure. Three okay. Rivers. Okay, there we got that. Yeah, well, built- actually, um, I, I read today that Harbor Yard was an homage to uh, Oriole Park at Camden Yard. So, hmm. oh. is it, by the end of this podcast, that. we got to come up with a name for the team because it can't be the Blue Fridge. It's got to be the Ansonia something. But uh, so valley, that was that. You could you could broaden it to the Valley, like the Valley, something starting with a V. If you want to keep the whole alliterative thing. So he, so Chris wanted to know who would pay for this thing. And I think that's this is sometimes a common misconception. I mean, Ansonia and Derby, yeah, they're not going to fund something like this uh, themselves out of the taxpayer's pocket because direct taxpayers, because we don't have the money. We can't, uh, you know, these brownfield projects are massive undertakings to clean up. And the purpose, I think, to some extent of having federal and state government is to help us with projects uh, like this. Because I, I, Chris was saying he, he doesn't agree that any type of public money uh, should be used. But I think, you know, Hugh, you did a whole fellowship, did you not, where you looked at brownfields like all over the yeah. the world, essentially. Yeah, I mean, uh, focusing on the Route 8 corridor, Bridgeport up through the valley uh, and, and north. And um, I mean, this can't be done without money from elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it can't all be private. I no, it, 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 it won't all be private. It won't all be public. There, there has to be a mix. You know, I mean, Sheila knows this better than anybody that the the process, you guys were talking about the, the need, you know, you have to prove the need. The process of getting the brownfield funding, this is something I didn't know before I looked into this, is, you know, you have to go through all these steps to show what you have planned, what you envision for the future project, and show why it's needed. And you have to go through all your demographics and say, well, this is who will use it, and this is what it will mean, and this is what the impact will be. It's not just saying, hey, we got this, you know, toxic field over here we could really use some help cleaning it up it's not that simple you really have to have an end product 
And, you know, I'm sure Sheila could, could talk about that. But that was something that I didn't know. Yeah, both on the federal and state level right. and, and more so on the fa- federal level that, y- you know, you, d- you do have to, to prove there's going to be job creation. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a key element. You're going to have sustainability. So all those sorts of things go into redevelopment and brownfields activities. So, so there, is, there is a formula um, and sometimes it's effective and sometimes not. But, you know, we at one point we did look at a regional regional sports complex for the Ansonia Copper and Brass site. Oh, no um, kidding. When was yeah, this? We were talking to we're still we're still, still sort of discussing somewhere. it. Uh, there was a private developer who was interested in perhaps funding a portion of a sports complex. Emmett O'Brien, we sat and spoke with them and the state delegation about a potential for a regional sports complex. It's certainly needed in the valley, um, but uh, you know we we've got to figure out what we're gonna we've got to figure out how to turn that site into one more attractive site at this point and try to help st- stir development and attract more developers. What are the challenges? Uh, and because like one thing I, I I really like about having. Uh, you want Sheila and Hugh is that the you know I look at the building and, and I'm just like I don't know what knock it down build something there for God's sakes, but obviously it's much more complicated than that. What are some of the challenges uh, if you could explain to to an ignoramus like myself that that you face in getting that thing redeveloped? Yeah, I mean the greatest challenge as Hugh mentioned are the brownfields. Um, there's some significant. Um, there's some significant remediation that has to take place before it's able to be reused. Um, and depending on the reuse, if, if it were a sports complex, a lot of that would be parking, which would be very helpful to the remediation efforts. Because you can kind of just cap it off naturally. You can cap Not a naturally, lot of it. but you right. can, it's easier to box it and put pavement. Correct, on. Right, right. right. So, you know, that, that's first and foremost. Right now, what's, being, what's uh, occurring is assessment activities which the city has received a grant for. We think it's, it's worthwhile uh, to take a look and see what the cost of taking those buildings down to the ground would be. And we do have a, a rough cost estimate, which is going to sound like a big number, but if you've worked with Brownfields and you understand the, the, uh, the issues, it's, it's really not. So it's about $8 million just to drop those buildings to the ground. That doesn't include what's, you know, what's below the surface. So we think that's a good workable number. Um, we think that uh, there's, there's possibility, a possibility to secure funding to, clean, to demolish and clean those buildings. But we're going to need, as you mentioned, state and federal assistance and even private assistance. The, in that effort. One, one of the main criticisms that I found of especially the federal brownfields funding, not to go too far down the brownfields, you know, hole, but one of the main criticisms is that projects tend to be funded that already have a developer and a plan in place. So something that somebody already has their eye on. So they say, oh, this would be a great place for a mall. This would be a great place for a stadium. And they say, this is how much it would cost. And this, the federal money will fill the gap between you know, what it would cost and what they have. And so a site like Copper and Brass, which maybe doesn't have you know, somebody you know, itching to get at it, which doesn't have somebody saying, this is what I want to do with this, that's going to fall you know, lower on the priority scale than something where you know, it's in a great location, but it's got some stuff that's got to get cleaned up. That's going to get first dibs because it's that, that's closer correct. to fruition, even though you know the need might be greater. You could certainly argue the need is greater. For that's a real catch grass. twenty two. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's just been, it's just sitting. It's just there sitting there. Well, it's so large. It's so large it's so, for, and, a, yeah. for a city this size. You know, it takes up one I don't know thirteenth of our si- entire city. But a good example of that is Fountain Lake. So mm. you know that that was an opportunity to retain. And just just ex- let's explain explain what Fountain Lake is sure. for for people who. So Fountain Lake, um, Fer- the Farrell Corporation was in Ansonia for, I believe, 120 years plus or minus. Right here on Main Street. Right, right here on Main Street. Um, it was a significant presence. It employed thousands of people over the years. And they were going to leave for another state, um, taking those jobs with them, 100 jobs approximately. So 
um, Mayor Cassetti saw that as a priority, the retention of that business, and we had to then make a case to the federal government for the retention of those jobs and the opening up of an industrial park. So what we did was get about $2.3 million for a, an access road that essentially opened up an industrial park, created a new home for Farrell, helped defer the cost of development for the company because they were at an impasse with the, devel- with the owner of the property. And the federal government saw that as a legitimate um, expense and a legitimate eligible activity, as well as the state. State put in a lot of money and the private uh, owner put in money as well, and as well as the city. So that, that, that was like the perfect storm that came together, created an industrial park, but, the, but there were steps uh, along the way which had to be taken in order to demonstrate why this was so critical. With EDA has very little money for the entire state of Connecticut, United States Economic Development Administration. And um, I don't want to I don't want to bore people, but we're we're part of a comprehensive economic development strategy. I'm the chairman of that. That's a 20 town region which has to come together, produce an economic development strategy and demonstrate need in the region um, before you qualify for federal funds. And that and that's pretty much how, you know, Ansonia was fortunate enough to get the funding for this industrial park. And that industrial park that Sheila O'Malley, the city's economic development director, is talking about is essentially up on the hill on, uh, is it Fountain Lake Road? Yeah, uh, Fountain Lake Boulevard. Or no, Boulevard. Farrow Boulevard, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, and you can Farrell see that Boulevard. basically, it's kind of cool when, I mean, you can see it out our window here. We, we're on West Main Street overlooking the Ansonia train station, but uh, if you come down like, uh, uh, whatever road that is off North Main Street where my kid's babysitter is, you can see like this uh, new building uh, up on the hill uh, right there overlooking. And that was good psychologically, I think, for Ansonia because Farrell leaving Ansonia to go out of state, or they at one point, one point they had been talking about, or they had moved to Oxford, like just psychologically. Some that's jobs a, were in Oxford and now they, they, consolidated, they consolidated back in, it right. in Ansonia. Would have been a big kick in the shins to, uh, loss to the community. For us. Yeah. yeah, huge impact. All right, so Hugh, hmm. <laughs> let's get down to brass tacks. Here. Okay. Could a stadium housing the former Bridgeport Bluefish work here in Ansonia, do you think? In your, in your travels around the world, you're globetrotting. Yeah. Looking at contaminated sites, which is kind of a weird thing to do for a living. It is but kind you, of a weird thing to do, yeah. You're yeah. putting them on the spot, Eugene. You really bit, are. A little bit. <laughs> you know, it, it, would, um, it would run into a lot of the same challenges that the Bluefish faced in Bridgeport. Um, the challenges of Connecticut, you know, when, when you talk about like these, these valley towns and they have these great downtowns and people say, oh, they got these great main streets and why can't they have, you know, arts and why can't they have this and that? Well, part of the reason is that you can drive 30 minutes and be in New Haven or you could drive, you mm-hmm. know, 30, 40 minutes and be in Norwalk or, or Stanford. It's a small state. Um, if you're a really big baseball fan and you're really into, you know, going to a game, Don't it's not York. hard to get to see the Yankees or the Mets. Yeah. It's really not. Um, it's certainly a lot easier to go to the Bluefish, but now you got the Yard Goats as well, and, and you've got other alternatives. So to say that a baseball stadium here would be different than it was in Bridgeport 15 minutes away is would be a hard sell, I would say. I just want to say for the record, we'll be editing your comments to make <laughs> it seem... We're keeping an open mind. We're keeping, we're an, keeping open an open mind. mind. To make it seem like Hugh totally supported this. I love the idea. <laughs> this wild idea. It's uh, going places. So then, all right, so that's been about... We talked about 30 minutes there about the Bridgeport Bluefish. Uh, Shilly, you should give out your email address for... Uh, Mr. I know Mr. Bolton will be hearing this tomorrow, right? How can he get Absolutely. in contact with you? Sure, it's S O M A L L E Y at ansoniact.org. There you go. Give me a call, Mr. Bolton. So let's talk about, uh, actually, before we do that, let me see if I can. You, you had mentioned the arts, and uh, you know why can't we have an art shop in every corner? But uh, that, uh, that, that's a natural segue. Actually, it's totally sure. unnatural, but I'm going to do it uh, anyway. Rock the Valley, a day of music, art, family, and fun, is scheduled for Saturday, August 19th which is this weekend, because I'll probably post this tomorrow, from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. at Nolan Field, and that's at 350 Wakeley Avenue in Ansonia. This year, 
They are featuring the cast of Beatlemania, as they did last year. Also appearing the Bernadettes, Bob's Fault, which just sounds like a natural Grateful Dead cover band. I don't know if that's accurate, but whatever. Mm. And the, the, uh, the Jimi Hendrix cover band, right? The Electric Lady Lady Band. band. We're featuring lady our band. Electric State Lady Senator Band George Logan. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Shredding. George, George Logan's gonna shredding be shredding on the electric guitar. Gonna be rocking out this weekend. It's electric holding it behind his back and then like <laughs> setting it on fire. And I don't stuff. know about smashing that. Smashing it, mm-hmm. smashing it. The fire marshal will come out of uh, the former fire marshal will come out of uh, retirement for that one. <laughs> Put a stop to that. It's electric lady band USA. There'll be crafters, food, a beer garden for Ethan, and kids activities. So you can check them out on uh, Facebook by searching Rock the Valley or go to cityofansonia.com, scroll down to featured events. If uh, we have bad weather, the rain date is August 20th. So that's that. Economic development in general uh, in Ansonia. Maybe we can check in, Sheila, on a couple of... Uh, there's been, like, I mean, uh, the bakery, Eddie's. Mm-hmm. I always want to say Eddie's, but it's... It, Eddie's? Eddie's it's Bake Eddie's. Shop. I heard... We heard, I guess. I might have heard it from you. Yeah. The shoe leather reporting I did on this. <laughs> and actually, weeks ago. somebody randomly, uh, we were on vacation last week. Ethan uh, extended his vacation one day and came back today. But at the end of the day yesterday, somebody came by and asked me about this, that Eddie's is going to be possibly moving in, moving to a new location in Ansonia, very close to this office, maybe. Correct. Um, they're in the process of selling the business. Uh, and the new and the new owner, if she acquires it, will either stay in that uh, location or move to a different location on Main Street. That's the the plan going forward. So possibly where uh, the f- Yankee peddler? Yankee peddler and possibly. Pawn, I think was- possibly. Okay. That's good shoe leather reporting. Ethan. Uh, yes. So we're hopeful. I mean, one and way yeah, or another. This is- speculation at this but you know that nothing yes. has been signed or anything but it, yeah, it, yeah. we're like 40 minutes into this podcast yeah. we're totally safe <laughs> <laughs> people are Say not listening but like i you know i've i've spoken there's i've heard it from enough people and people you know in the know that it's it's not just wild you know some wild idea i think yeah i heard say. there was somebody cleaning out a basement oh, we're getting really good there, there's a lot of renovation that needs to take place in where eddie's currently is so that's part of the negotiation process, and I don't want to talk too much about it, but I believe that the uh, prospective new owner is negotiating and working on that. And in all seriousness, I, I bring that up not to spread gossip, but I mean, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an iconic mm. business Amazing. here, uh, not just in Ansonia, but in, in the region. And yeah, it's so, known even outside the region. Like I, my, my mom works at an accounting firm in New Milford and her the owner of it lives like in Orange or Milford or uh, something. So they'll drive through and like to get to like 67, they'll occasionally drive through like 115 here and they'll like stop and get, oh, of course I got to stop and get Eddie's for the, for the office. You mm. know, it's just, it's, it's widely known. So obviously people want it to stay uh, mm-hmm. on Main Street in a new location and uh, would be great. And you f- feel free to chime in with any thoughts, questions. Sure. Any uh, rumors about have. Ansonia? Just right. Anything that you've heard. Just because we need to, that we need to kill. the blue fish are coming? Mm-hmm. Sure. We need to okay. kill some time. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Has your, have your, has your text light lit up <laughs> yeah, yet? Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're live here, right? So. <laughs> sure. No, actually. Yeah. That, that's a good point. Maybe, I don't know, maybe somebody has ESP. Listen, uh, it's an honor to be on here with you, Bailey. He's got, um, you know, no, I mean, I say that in all seriousness, is a, uh, a wealth of knowledge about economic development and brownfields and so forth and worked with him for many years. Thank you. Thanks. So, just want to say that. Yeah. Okay. So the, <laughs> uh, how about the uh, former, uh, not the former, next to Target, we had Mayor Cassetti in here like a year or two ago. Uh, was I don't know? Was it a year or two ago? Ethan? it was, and he was saying that uh, he was like essentially naming businesses that were going to uh, move in there. Yep. Uh, ha- and that was Eclipse Development purchased the property. Correct. Four twenty right. Main Street. Okay, four twenty yep. Main Street next to the, the, the big open field, essentially next next to Target. Correct. Is that right? And right, a right portion is? of Target property. They're okay. also negotiating How, on. Where is that in the uh, the process, and what ideally would Enzonia like to see there, understanding that government, I think this is a common misconception, government doesn't dictate what businesses go where. 
uh, essentially. We'd like to, but we can't. But yes. Um, There's a whole so, free market. So, and, oh, you know, yeah, it's really that's annoying. right. Yeah. Okay. So um, currently, the city was fortunate enough to ask for and receive an assessment grant for that area because there's a lot of contamination oh, really? and like, there is what, what, oh yeah from the latex foam site right. the target site and some i think of there used to be migrated. like a big oil tank associated yes. with uh, maybe ansonia cup one of those feral one of those companies oh. was down there too okay. right so we're we're in the process of working with uh, nogtuck valley council of governments on that brownfields assessment shout out to rick grant. dunn shout out to rick dunn always uh thank yeah. you rick and Arthur, you better because then he'll just right. I'll just turn off the uh, federal <laughs> dollars. I don't things. know; it hasn't been turned off yet. I, I'm hoping to keep going. So uh, once that assessment is completed, they'll have a plan for remediation, which will probably just involve a lot of fill put in place in that area. Um, but the developer has proposed three site pads: uh, a, a big box and two other smaller retail or restaurant pads uh the one the one big box i think has is all but signed uh an agreement with the developer so he's very anxious to get started even uh even in the fall and winter and ethan who does who does eclipse usually work with didn't we, we've done stories mm-hmm. in the past they have certain because sheila's not going to spill those beans but right or, or you're looking that up there's a i wish i could remember there's certain companies they mm. Have a close relationship. Big wanna baseball say, supplier. Supplier. Oh, a lot of baseball. Sporting goods. No, she's shaking <laughs> right. her head. No. Oh, oh, I get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A callback. That's called a callback. So that's exciting, but it's got a, it's got a, it's got a ways to go. It Maybe sounds like in terms of something having to do with pets. pets. Oh yeah, like pet Petco or something like that. Pet smart and like. I'm not uh, sure. yeah, Hugh, Let's just see. Hugh probably reported on this. They've, they've got, stupidly, we they've missed got it. A relationships <laughs> with, uh, according to their website, which I'm on right now, uh, Target, which would help them theoretically get that agreement to oh, yeah. use, you know, access through there. Uh, Staples, Bed Bath and Beyond, Toys R Us, Home Depot. Oh, Bed Bath Michaels, and Beyond. That's what I was thinking. Office okay. Max. Uh, so a lot of like big names in the retail business. Okay, then. Then I think I've asked you this on a previous podcast, but I'm like terrified at the fact that uh, you know we've got I mean, we've got an empty shopping center in Derby, which is just depressing uh, mm. uh, to look at. Uh, and no disrespect to Derby, it's you know the, the Walmart moved out and other businesses have closed there. Uh, it's such a I mean Radio Shack is gone. Uh, you know it, it'd been around forever. The, it's retail seems really really shaky uh, at the moment. And how does that affect a project like this. Yeah, I mean, some retail is shaky. IHOP's closing a, a bunch of uh, locations uh, nationwide. Right. But yeah, some retail is shaky and others are really strong. We're seeing Marshalls and Home Goods. They're very strong. So um, we're seeing a lot of new stores popping up. But I think I think Eclipse knows the, the market very well. It's done their research. So I think these are going to be stores that are going to be frequented. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, I leave it up to them. But there are there are some needs we have right here in Ansonia that will be met and even in the Valley by some of these uh, big box stores. Hopefully, you know, the, the plaza across the street is doing very well. Mm. Big Y and Home Goods pushing out of Marshalls, hopefully. Um, so that that's always been strong. And then just uh, sort of traveling down the street from uh, the shop, Big Y Shopping Center up there on East Main Street and Main Street, you got Banco's under new ownership. That's a music store yep. which current are just went under a, an extensive renovation. Correct. Talk about that a little. Yeah, I mean e- East Main Street with uh, I believe with the new residential units that we're we're. Um, looking to see come online and i think with the parking uh restructured and and potentially a parking garage we're going to see a lot of activity on east main street spilling over from main street and part of that is you know joel um the owner the new owner of uh, banco's has completely renovated that building and it's it's um if you haven't been in you should go it's beautiful upstairs is like a um recording studio he's very into uh, performing and he's got a guitar manufacturer ethan can help me out with this but i can't remember the 
I apologize. I'll look um, up the, uh, uh, one of the only story. guitar manufacturers left in the United States is now going to be above Banco's. So that's a big, you know, that's a big deal. And if you just go down East Main Street, it's completely changed that section. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's yeah, exciting. They, they, they redid the, the the facade out there, right? Uh, and which I, is a big deal. And we have the uh, uh, the car dealership, Fitzgerald's. Uh, Fitzpatrick's, Fitzpatrick's did a total, oh! total renovation. Oh, as it came out of my that's as it came okay. out of my mouth, I was that's already okay. getting embarrassed. So it's exciting, you know. It's thanks exciting. for the help, Hugh. Sorry. <laughs> I know, Hugh, help us out. <laughs> Um, that's exciting, you know, that's exciting. And it also dovetails on what's happening on Main Street. So. And uh, then you've got that uh, sort of large former restaurant that's been open and closed like a hundred times, uh, which clearly, you know, that, that there's challenges there. I'm talking about the former... Rosamina's, uh, are you talking Savor Lounge. Oh, and the, Savor, yep. And then... I'm Mustang Snookers. Sally. Lanza's. Lanza's. Snookers. It was Snookers for a long time. I think that's what Mustang that was. Mustang Sally. Mustang right. Sally. Yeah, Sally. Yeah, which I thought, was, I thought that was going to be... Here's well, that's a good example Here's of why like I'm a, a business moving in somewhere, and there was like a lot of a lot of traffic there initially, but then it sort of just it waned just, off. Yeah, like it just as, died as, immediately, yeah. and that was a for, it was a country bar. Uh, it's a big space there. What? How? How is uh, the marketing of that? going and do you and i mean and do you have any like direct involvement with that um, i mean i we try to we try to send interested tenants there uh to the owner we've spoken with the owner and met with the owner i think that space is difficult it's nine thousand square feet so if you are not a chain coming into that space it's very difficult to fill it fill nine thousand square feet so the thought is perhaps maybe subdivide it um, into smaller space that's, you know, t- to uh, not bite off more than you can chew because these these restaurants and bars have come in, but they don't have the type of following that's going to fill that, that size space. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, you heard it first on the Valley Independent Sentinel, um, there is someone interested <laughs> in perhaps doing sort of a performance live, sta- live bands hmm. stage there he, there premier who already has some success home? a little bit farther down rory dolan's and yonkers no <laughs> <laughs> no it, uh the guitar thing it's de cava guitars de cava, this, thanks, that's Ethan. not my that's uh, uh from a story f- uh, written by mike mako in the connecticut post august 4th credit where it's due Plug. he's the best yep he's good he's great won't friend me on facebook no matter how, my, <laughs> how many times he i've won't? tried really <laughs> He's not Why, really active Mike? on Facebook, so you're no, not missing much. No, he isn't yeah. really active. Uh, all right, so you're saying there's a possibility of some type of concert hall opening up at the former Lanzas there at East Main Street? I am saying that. Right. Is there's it, been some interest from, okay, gotcha. from someone who's already done great things on East Main Street. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking about it. Rich DiCarlo. It's the uh, the Safari Caffeine Lounge guys. That's a, that's a great. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the Valley Independent pretty much subsidizes right. that, that Ethan, place. Ethan, yeah, yes. Ethan goes there sixteen times time a, day. a day usually. Okay. And then Ethan, did you have any uh, particular properties that you're curious? Since we have uh, Sheila O'Malley in here, the well, we, we've, head of. We've asked about them. Uh, you know, the Eddies was the the the, the most recent one. Because um, if not, yeah. we, I want to go back to the uh, the big redevelopment project. Uh, right down the road from yeah, us. Yeah, by we, all means. Yeah. What, what about uh, Molto Bene? Yeah, so there's been oh, that's interest. A good one. Oh, yeah. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I always forget about Wakely you. Avenue. Thank you. Yeah, there's been interest in Molto Bene from a number of um, sort of very popular developers, mm. uh, too, as a matter of fact, um, Jerry Nasserino and also uh, Tonino Movuli have also been looking at that site. Mm. For various, I think I think Jerry had proposed some sort of a bed and breakfast or a wedding reception um, venue, and Tonino was looking for more of a storage office space type uh, type development. Um, nothing yet, but we're hopeful that that will come to one one activity will come to fruition. That's a big, highly visible uh, spot. It's a right great there. spot. Yeah, yeah, right. On, literally on. a lot of history that used to be like raps paradise or right. something. You know, they're going back years, decades and decades. Uh, John J. Sullivan. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Right. And then uh, anything else you wanted to ask about Hugh? Now that you got it. No, I was just curious if there was any anything new with the uh, Riverwalk 
you know, any new Great. I'm developments glad you, coming I'm up glad with that. I'm glad you asked that. I brought a not, map. Not, which not to no take over your see. podcast. Yeah, she, but, no, you, no, Q, please take over our podcast. Yeah, we're, but you know, I spent five minutes trying to identify a building that uh, that'll be great you, listening you, you, for people. You're a not, little sharper than us after after we were away for a week. So you yeah. know that complements what we're doing on the economic development. Front. Sheila is opening up uh, 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 some type of site development plan here. It's very exciting. It feels very professional. Our listeners can really take a good look at this. Um, it's white with so, black lettering. <laughs> we've we've just completed um, West Main Street beautification, and we're working on segment eight, which is going to be. Uh, which will cross over the r- the river with a pedestrian bridge. Where? Where's the pedestrian um, bridge going to go? The br- pedestrian bridge is going to, uh, it's going to go right where the um, where the current bridge is, where the railroad track bridge is. Oh, okay. So it's going to be it's going to be side by side, um, and it's going to dump out onto Pershing Drive. Shouldn't say dump out, but it'll it'll and end up end up on Pershing Drive. Um, we're looking at completing segments three and four, which is in the target area, which will include the mayor. The mayor spoke about this a lighthouse, so with a, a platform wow. at the bend of the That's, river. Wait, come on now. Charger Sheila. lighthouse. Hold on a second, Mayor Cassetti's calling. How it. did I miss to, this? To warn all that shipping going. <laughs> That's over. right. <laughs> what That's is right. This? We have a long, rich we snipers shipping up there. History. That's right. And we really? don't want boats. We don't want boats, uh, you know. Running aground. Going running aground. The ground. dangerous shoals. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Ethan. Got to keep those derby people out in their kayaks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's what's being proposed. We're, we're, we're trying to make a complete loop around. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we're going to eventually bring foot traffic into Main Street. That's, that's the key, I think. One of the problems that I've heard mentioned is the, uh, the flood control. You know, the barriers that keep people away from the river. Is, is there any possibility of working with that? Are those are those there forever? I mean, what, what's the story the, about the walls? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, yeah, that's you know, we've, we've had yeah. some yeah. discussion with the Army Corps, um, but you have to you, you have to go to the Army Corps with a with a definitive plan, as right. we were talking about before. You know, what's what what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Right. What it's what's it gonna what are the benefits to the community? Why do you Obviously, want to take down our nice walls? Yeah, yeah. those are uh, you know obvious benefits to yeah. taking down the walls. It's like a, a prison, uh, yeah. you know, scene. But mm. um, at some point, you know, we're going to offer alternatives mm. to that, and we we the mayor doesn't see why there why there couldn't be an alternative to those walls mm. it would be very helpful to us. Sure. Um, and I don't I don't know that they're necessary, although I'm not an engineer. So right now we have to work with them. Right. Yeah. And then uh, just in terms of the site plan you have, uh, what Sheila has is, uh, I mean, it's a site plan. It shows the Naugatuck River in the middle, and then there's an orange line going around uh, the Naugatuck. Where's the existing trail on this map, or does it show up? Like, so, so that's bridge. Oh, so it would be way over. It's way off, over here. Off yeah, this map is just the, the segments that are left. And there's to, numbers, to I guess, completed. that's... Stage one, stage two, in the order would you'd want to get funding and make it happen? Is that we how we sort of that? are bouncing around a little bit? Okay. Segment eight, we have funding. It it was stalled out because of the permitting process, and because that permitting process took so long, it required an additional um, grant. So we did get that, and we are doing clearing and grubbing right now. Get in preparation for the bridge. It's a hundred and sixty foot bridge that's going to go across footbridge. Um, and then we did get some more money for segment three and four. And this that's is Target. That's target. Right here. Okay, that's next to Target. I'm sure, the listeners can see that very well, they, clearly they can, where I'm pointing. Close your eyes. Oh. You can see. You can, <laughs> okay, envision, you can envision it. it. A trail next to Target going on the uh, what is that? I don't know what end of Target that is. It's uh, closest the, to Main Street and then going on to what is that? It's what, what the is? north end of okay. Target. But you know, you close your eyes and you can envision a Bluefish Stadium. As well. There we go. I told you, right. you with, with the yeah. lighthouse looming <laughs> over. Well, you can see the Bluefish Stadium w- from the platform on the lighthouse. So that's exciting. And what we're talking about in general is a, is a walking trail that would go uh, through downtown Ansonia around the Naugatuck River. I mean, Correct. that's pretty exciting. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about uh, development in our towns and, and uh, readers who've 
grew up here uh, are sometimes they're cynical and rightfully so because plans happen and then the, they're put on a shelf and gather dust and, and people end up getting asthma because they're so old and, and rotten. But Sheila has experience with this very thing because you were involved heavily in writing grants and getting money for Derby, right? I was, yep. That uh, I did similar activities in Derby, um, but you know, I credit I credit Mayor Cassetti. I have got to credit Corporation Council John Marini. We've got to and our <laughs> Eugene. He I, can't I was see kidding, that. No, I was just I just I just waved my hand, joking. Uh, I'm listen, joking. And our, and our board of aldermen has been very supportive in these efforts. So you know, securing the grants is one thing, but moving forward and actually implementing the projects is a whole nother thing. And the mayor wants action. So and I and I think you know. I I think we've done, we've moved the city forward. We're we're continuing to move it forward, and green, the Greenway and the River Walk and the bike and pedi paths. Those are all part of economic development. They generate interest. They pull people in, and they bring people downtown. And and just to to, to close this out, unless anybody uh, wants to add anything else, I just wanted to ask: How many towns uh, have an economic development director who also specializes in? In grant writing, is that common? Because that seems to be sort of unique here in the Valley. We have, like, Seymour has a part-time economic development director who's a realtor. Uh, and Derby has sort of a, a planner who's the chief of staff and also uh, does economic development. But it, but I haven't seen Ansonia and Derby because of the uh, old industrial properties. Grant writing is equally important as the... Yeah, I don't know how you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And so when, you know, I've been doing this quite quite a long time, but when you're looking for an economic development director, and especially in the Valley, you want someone who can also secure funding for those priorities. So if economic development is your priority, you can't really move forward, attract development, uh, make sites uh, level and on an even playing field with other communities unless you're going to the the community itself is going to put some skin in the game and so how do you do that you, you secure funding you secure st- state and federal funding and also private funding so i think they go hand in hand um and i and i think the focus for for ansonia in particular has to be economic development so a lot of the grants that i get are more economic development focused um and some community development grants, but but it has to be the priority here. Gotcha. And then I said that would be my final, but I wanted to ask Hugh, uh, okay. since basically we want to keep Hugh here as long as we can, so whatever story <laughs> he's working on, he'll, he'll miss you deadline. You could scoop yeah, it. Yeah, it, it, it's already too it. late. So. It's, it's done. Right. Yeah, it's, it's done. It's over, yeah. So I had mentioned briefly that you were the recipient of a fellowship, uh, but I didn't explain in any way what the fellowship was, uh, what a journalism fellowship is. Hmm. Uh, and I was wondering if you would just take a, a couple of minutes to talk about, it's a, it's a couple of years back now, yep. but uh, what it was and what you did. And then I wanted to ask you uh, one just uh, additional question about it. So. Sure. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a fellowship for editorial writing. Um, formerly, I was an editorial and uh, opinion writer for The Post. And uh, I won it based on my writing on brownfields um, in Ansonia and Derby and Bridgeport and places like that. And what, what I was year? able to, when this was, was uh, 2013. Okay. Uh, what I was able to do was they gave me, uh, um, you know, a big piece of money and I was able to not work, you know, go away from my day job for eight months and travel around the country. And I went to Europe as well to look at basically how other places do it to see what, you know, this is a widespread problem, deindustrialization, you know, moving on from factories. Um, what do other places do? And could we do the same thing here? And so I went to uh, different places around the country. I went around the Northeast. I also went to Chattanooga and Tennessee. I went to Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, a lot of what I found in this country is that whether you're red state, blue state, Northeast, South, whatever, everybody's playing by the same rules. Right. Even in, you know, deep red Tennessee, they got the same parameters they're working under. They're trying to get federal money. They're trying to get economic development plans. They're trying to build jobs. It's, you know, there, there really is no... Um, magic. Th- there's no magic formula. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, when I went to Germany, that, that was really um, what was the catalyst for, for the main um, thrust of, of my, my work at the end. They, they really take a different approach they approach things regionally, and that's one of the things, if you know Connecticut and Connecticut politics, we just do not do. 
Um, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And so one of the things that, that I focused on in, in the, the work, the, the, the final stories that I wrote was on, we, gotta, we have to take a regional approach to this. We have to look at this as one big problem rather than not only a city by city problem, but a property by property problem. I mean, this is, this is a Connecticut wide, Northeast wide problem. The entire economy has changed right. in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Everybody is struggling to adapt to it. If we don't take a big picture look at it, we're never going to see, you know, the kind of change that we want to see. And so what they did in Germany is, is they repurposed a lot of these old factories and old industrial sites into um, all kinds of new uses. Some of them are tourist attractions. Some of them are performing arts centers. Some of them are apartments, uh, all kinds of things you can think of. But they retained the original structure of the factories and of the ironworks and of the shipyards and all of the things that they had in their previous economy. And they built around that. They cleaned it up, you know, m made it safe for people to be there. Um, did all the brownfield stuff that they do, capped it, you know, everything else, but maintained that the sort of um, that hold on the past so that people know where they came from. And I said, well, we have all these buildings here. You know, we have this coal plant in Bridgeport. We have this, you know, brass factory in, in Ansonia. We could do something like that here. And so part of it was this sort of speculative look at like the, the Route A corridor, Bridgeport up through Shelton and Derby and Ansonia up into Waterbury and Thomaston and up and beyond. There's all these factory sites. This is a story you ended up this writing This is a story that Connecticut I ended up Post. writing. Yeah, it was, it was a three-part thing. And the final part was a, a story looking at how would that work? Like, could we make this happen in Connecticut? And you know, I, I think that there there are some ideas that we can import from other places. I, I think that there there are some great ideas that that they do in in Europe. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean it's it's easily applicable here. But I, I think the way we're going about it here, this sort of site by site, you know, whatever a developer really happens to have their eye on is what gets the, the priority. Uh, that, that's not really good. just not a way to to do things. Um, not not to go too too far on the tangent here, but one of the things that I found was you know you, you see a lot of praise for certain places in their brownfields programs. They say, oh, New York City has this great brownfields program. You know, they get these properties and they turn them around and someone turns it into a, a mini mall or whatever. Well, property in New York City is valuable. That's right. So that's why the brownfields program is successful. And it's the same thing in Boston. It's the same thing in any place that people want to be. Yeah, somebody's going to find the money to turn the old brass factory into a, you know, condos or whatever it is. And Sonia is not going to get the same priority. So the system that we have in this country where we're sort of all competing against each other in this particular, you know, circumstance in terms of brownfields really is not working. So that's the, the gist of it. And then was there any, in your travels, was there any one project uh, that you looked at and said, and I'm going to get really specific here because we're based in the Valley. Yeah. Whoa, that would be something that I could see possibly happening uh, in a Derby or Ansonia. Was there anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I got a, a tour of Copper and Brass before it completely closed down, when there were still 10 people working there or something like that. Right. This is where you guys got that drone footage you had with yeah, your story? Exactly, yeah, exactly. pretty cool. Exactly. And, and I got to walk all around all through it, and you see all this equipment and these buildings, and like you realize that people have been working there for 150 years or That's whatever right. it is, and the history is just so overwhelming. And you look at it and you say, all right, if you clean it up, if you take all the stuff that could make you sick, you take that out of here, you leave the structures in place, and you turn it into something different, people would want to see that. They would want to be a part of that. They would want to know, you know, what used to be here, what it is now. You've got this river here. You know, this Naugatuck River is this unbelievable asset. And nobody thinks of it that way, or they didn't think of it that way. For years and years, they thought of it as, well, that's where the stuff from the factory goes, you know, right. or, or that's what powers the factory right. or whatever it is. That's why they built the factories here. You know, now people look at rivers as like, well, I want to go take a walk on the river. I want to go fishing. I want to do this. It's a natural resource. Um, you know, th this idea of taking advantage of, of, you know, what these towns have with these downtowns and the, the rivers and the river walks and everything else and adding in the historical element of these factories is just the, the potential is, is, is amazing. Um, you know, getting from here to there is challenging, but you can certainly see it. You can see what they did in, in Germany and in, in, in the Ruhr Valley, which is, you know, their historic industrial heartland, which is exactly like what so much of the Northeast was like and what they've done with it. You know, a lot of money they spent and a lot of planning and a lot, you know, so many things that don't happen here that went into that. But you can certainly see it. You can see the potential for it. 
and, and copper and brass was really the, the site that I looked at. It's like, you can just envision it. Great potential. Yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, before I close out, I kind of have my back rudely turned to Ethan here, which has probably limited his participation That's in this particular right. podcast. But is there anything anybody wanted to add before we, uh, what is that French? Bid adieu, Ethan? You, <laughs> can you say that for us? Adieu. Yes. Adieu. Yeah. We're all good? I'm well, good. I want to thank uh, Sheila O'Malley and Sonia's Economic Development Director and Hugh Bailey, the uh, Hearst, Connecticut business editor, for putting up with me and coming on our podcast and, and chatting about uh, all things uh, and Sonia. I appreciate it. Happy thank to do you. It. Thanks for having us. And for Ethan Fry, this is Eugene Driscoll. We will uh, see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>